Welcome listeners to the Strategic HR Show. Today we have an amazing guest, Neda Nasruddin. She is the CEO and founder of Rise Up For You, and we're very excited to have her here today. I'll take a few minutes and have Neda introduce herself and talk a little bit about what she's done in the past and how she is doing today. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here, and I'm very, very much looking forward to the conversation. So I'm the CEO, I'm the founder of Rise Up For You, but I didn't always start that way. I actually started as a performer. That was my first career. Mm -hmm. And I used to tour the world internationally as a singer and a dancer, you know, similar to musical theater. And that's where I really recognized and began to understand that as important as the technical skills are, a lot of the challenges that were happening in my first career with our team, with our cast, where we were traveling, were not related to technical skills. It was all like how we communicated, how we showed up, you know, our self-awareness, our self-management. Shortly after that, I became an executive of an education corporation. I was 27. I had 200 team members under me. And then in the evening, I was a professor for a community college. And I was teaching soft skills there, like life skills for freshmen. And I quickly saw as an executive and as an educator, the gap that was happening, even in the corporate workplace and in academic institutes were these actually these human skills, right? So people, you know, with PhDs, master's degrees, I mean, you name it, all the certificates in the world still weren't really functioning, you know, at their best within the workplace, really struggling with purpose, meaning, communicating, leading their team, confidence. And at the same time, I was watching this with the younger generation every year coming into the college, like couldn't even stand up and say their name and really struggling with these soft skills, which are actually very difficult. And so that kind of led me to where I am today, where I'm the owner of Rise Up For You. And this is all we focus on with corporations and individuals around the world. Our goal is to help organizations and individuals enhance their potential through really understanding and mastering the soft skills that determine most of our success. Absolutely. And that's such an important piece of it because, you know, even one of our founders here at FutureSolve, they talk a lot about if they had one last dollar spent in their budget, they'd spend it on the soft skills that really yeah. make or break managers, leadership, yeah. impact in the business. I mean, it's truly, there's 100%. a big ROI. So one of the biggest things is when you're talking about soft skills, you know, a lot of companies, they focus a lot on like technical skills, does they need it for the day-to-day -day and the operations that they're doing. But tell us more about the details of how soft skills could be focused on, how do they see if there's even enough focus on soft skills, how do they support employees, a little bit more of, you know, where can business leaders start? Yeah, I think the first thing, honestly, is the mindset has to change around soft skills. It's still very much seen as an afterthought. You know, if there's money in the budget, if we want to do team building in a team retreat, then we will do this with our team. But honestly, soft skills, it has to be an everyday thing, just like a sales strategy, a marketing strategy. It has to be a part of the culture. And so the first thing is really getting executives and leaders to understand that soft skills have to be just as important as technical skills. So as much as we're training and developing our team on the technical skills, again, with the sales strategy, marketing strategy, technical strategy, we also have to have a people strategy that we're working towards every day. And it's really interesting because much of the research shows that 93% of leaders, okay, Harvard Business Review just released this, 93% of leaders actually believe that soft skills are the most important skills, but mm -hmm. less than 25% of organizations actually invest in it consistently. So like that doesn't make sense, right? right. So we mm -hmm. need to switch the mindset and have a strategy, we call it like a culture roadmap and a people strategy where we're developing continuously coaching, modeling, mentoring, training our team on emotional and social intelligence, which is by far the most important thing on self-confidence as a career team member. That's where we need to start if they want it to be sustainable and if they want to see the ROI financially. I always laugh when I hear executives say, well, you know, we spent $25,000 on this retreat and this training and nobody learned from it. I'm like, yeah, because you did eight hours of content condensed in one day, right? That's like going to the gym and working out for eight hours. And then a month later saying, I didn't lose any weight because they never went back to the gym. 
Correct. Right. So really understanding that it has to be continuous learning and growth, and you will see the financial impact. You'll see the impact in productivity, and you'll also see the impact in communication and culture. Oh, absolutely. And then the other thing is, I feel like a lot of companies invest in leaders. They'll invest it at top heavy, but we don't really support leaders that are you know, new managers or first time leaders as well. And that's become a very big aspect that we hear from our side is definitely something that, you know, you'll spend 25,000 on a CEO to go train, but sometimes they won't spend $500 on a new manager that is on the front line, touching the customer, doing the day-to-day operations that impact the business as a whole. I do agree with you. I think it has to be recurring, it has to be accessible, and it has to be available to all, not just a trickle-down effect, which is another aspect of it. But that's why a lot of leaders at the top, I think, do think it's important. But whether it's trickling down all the way through the organization is another question. Yeah. And you bring up a really good point because at Rise Up For You, we believe in like the sandwich approach, right? So Mm -hmm. we're elevating the top and we're elevating like entry-level positions. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because we understand that it takes a handshake to make transformation occur within an organization. So what that means is that we've worked with companies that have a really great culture up top, meaning the leaders believe in growth, they believe in development, and they want their team to have it, right? The same thing but they don't train their team, like you said, okay? Mm -hmm. So then what happens is that you have the team that don't know how to push their potential. They really don't understand what it means to have growth, right? And they're stuck in their own ways, which is how people are, that's normal. Mm -hmm. So if you really wanna see a win-win approach, then we need to be training and developing the executive level team simultaneous to the rest of the team. That's where the handshake happens. And that's where now both parties are taking ownership of their growth. And they're showing up as their best. And that's really, really important. And, you know, oftentimes we also see the opposite, which is the executive team says, we're going to train our people, but they don't train themselves. Mm -hmm. And now their people become a little bit more emotionally intelligent. They become more empathetic, right? In some cases, more adaptable to leadership than the leaders themselves. And then we see the contrast. So that's why it's super important that both are creating the handshake and working together. Because that's where most of the transformation happens. Unless you have an executive team of leaders that are phenomenal at coaching. And see, that's the biggest challenge, right? See, most companies say, well, we'll train our top level. And then they'll coach and they'll model and their mentor down. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is that most individuals don't know how to coach themselves. We're putting a lot of, you know, expectation on our leaders to say, learn all of these skills. And at the same time, be an amazing coach and educator and trainer to your team. Right. And so that's why it's very important that it's happening simultaneously. Yeah, no, you bring up a really important part. So it's taking the initiative and saying, I want to start with improving or even investing in soft skills. But what's the strategy? Is it just training them? Is it making them coaches? Is it making them be able to model it and show it? Is it helping first line managers even identify and help each other? Maybe there's round tables or circles where they can bounce ideas. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into that. And it's truly impacting not just on performance and how the company matters, but I feel It makes a big difference on culture, how to make sure the company is progressing and even innovation in new areas of business, because all of a sudden everybody's on the same page. What's your advice, Netta, if somebody wanted to, you know, take a first stab at this or even see where to start or, you know, how can we identify the best area that makes the best impact? Do you have some thoughts on, you know, what companies could start or how can they do that? Yeah, the first thing that I would say, and this is a little bit scary and organizations don't always like to do this, Mm -hmm. is to do what we call a culture report. Okay, so for example, we have a culture report that we'll send out to our companies that they give to their entire team. Mm -hmm. And then their team goes through this, basically this assessment and the survey of the company, the culture, leadership experiences, et cetera, just to pinpoint where the challenges are. 
Now, the important thing about the culture report is you want to make sure like ours, for example, it's very solution oriented because the last thing we want is feedback from team members that's just complaints. Like yeah. we want to understand, okay, if you don't feel heard, what's a solution, right? So that way we actually have information to work with and we understand how to best serve the team. So I always say first, just figure out the culture report and what your team needs, because sometimes as leaders, we think the team needs this and they come back with a completely different set of ideas that we didn't even know it was happening. So just getting an assessment, understanding of the lay of the land of your team and your culture and your leadership. And then from there, you can devise a plan and a program and say, wow, I didn't realize that 80% of our team struggles with confidence. Okay, so we need to create a roadmap where we can teach our team how to have emotional awareness, self-confidence, internal motivation so that they can be their best self. Or, hey, I didn't realize that people are really struggling with communication and the different generations in the workplace. And they're having a hard time communicating between generation Z, you know, millennials, generation X. Okay, great. So we know that the area of focus and the training needs to be geared towards impactful communication and bridging the gap. But it's hard to say this is what you need if they don't know what they need. Correct. I'm going to straight up and say that I can guarantee that every single challenge in the workplace that's rooted with people is going to come down to emotional and social intelligence. And emotional and social intelligence is a buzzword today. So a lot of people think they know what it is. And they're like, yeah, you know, you like you understand your emotions and you recognize emotions in others. And that's not true at all. Emotional intelligence has 18 pillars that fall under it, including diversity, equity, and inclusion, coaching, leadership, empathy, social awareness, public speaking and professional etiquette, self-confidence, internal motivation, integrity. I mean, I can keep going. So now I say all those things and people are like, oh yeah, we need that. We need that. So when people come to me and they say, hey, we're really struggling with leadership. We need to start with emotional intelligence because leadership is an entire branch under that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is really the core of basically every challenge in the workplace as it comes down to people and communication. Wow. That's definitely something I didn't even know that it had all these different branches under emotional intelligence. And a lot of times it's just categorized as one area. For companies, when they're looking at, you know, starting an initiative, you know, our listeners are both business executives and even HR people. And if you're an executive and you believe this is the solution, you want to take action, I feel like, you know, there's probably a lot that you can do. But for the HR individuals that are looking at getting buy-in or showing ROI or building a business case for how emotional intelligence or soft skills are going to make a big impact for the business. You know, do you have any advice on overcoming those roadblocks or getting buy-in or really presenting the data or the facts? What do you think would be the ideal way of actually beginning that whole change? Yeah, honestly, you really have to show the ROI financially and the impact that it's making, right? So a lot of times companies, they understand how much money they've made each yeah. month. But I bet you if an HR director went to the executive and said, this is how much it costs us every year to have employee turnover. The executive is going to say, what? It costs us $5 million to turn over 12 employees. Why are they leaving? What's happening? Why is it costing us so much? It's really easy to then say, but you can invest, you know, 30,000, 50,000, maybe a hundred thousand to train our team, to get them to stay, to have a better culture, which hopefully is going to make the impact on the turnover, right? So we had one company, for example, and I had this exact same conversation. I was coaching the executive. So only the executive was getting coaching. And of course, I'm trying to influence to like get in the company and how can we support you and support the larger picture? And she's like, I don't know. And I was like, do me a favor, just go to HR and ask them how much is spent on your employees leaving every single year. She came back to me and she said, I can't even believe the response I got. And I said, well, tell me. She said, the response I got from HR was that we stopped counting because it hit the tens of millions of dollars every single year of money that we're spending when employees leave. And I'm like, there's your answer. 
So I think if HR can start to show the data in that regard, like here's how much money we're losing, here's how many hours we spend every single week re-communicating things that we've already communicated, right? Here's how much money we're spending on leaders that are struggling and we have to have meetings with them. This is what it costs. But if we can teach them these skills, then we can minimize some of those costs and probably see a better productivity rate, again, leadership, communication, and you will save money. But we have to put that on paper and we have to show it for them to really click and understand. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm going to switch the topic a little bit, but I know a lot of people are thinking about this, but when you talk about soft skills, emotional intelligence, some of those new areas that companies focus on, we also talk about how it impacts different generations, you know, Gen Z in the workforce, yeah. millennials, all the other ones. Are you seeing investment in soft skills or a pivot of a company to be able to best align with different generations and be able to accommodate multiple generations in the workplace to be that case when you do make that shift into focusing on soft skills? Yeah, it has to be. So I'll be honest and say that the iGen and the millennials, right, which are the newer generations in the workplace, they are very driven by purpose training and coaching. That makes them thrive. They enjoy the developmental piece, okay? Now, whether they're amazing at it is irrelevant, but they just enjoy getting the coaching. They want to have purpose. They want to have meaning. They want to develop. They want to grow. Like that's their thing, right? And we see in some of the older generations that it's not that they don't want to grow, but there's a different mentality when it comes to work. It's like, I'm here to make a paycheck. I'm here to do what I got to do. And so sometimes that training for them is, you know, why? Why can't they just do my job, right? But that's why teaching the emotional intelligence and showing them how it can make an impact for them, not only professionally, by the way, but also personally, that's where you get the buy-in from your team. And most of the time, like after we do one training session, it doesn't matter what generation they're in. They're like, I could use this. It's either I can use this in the workplace or I can use this with my wife or my husband or my kids or whatever it is, because emotional intelligence, it's not limited to the career. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I love that. You know, thing that I also see is if you invest in emotional intelligence and soft skills across the business, when all of those individuals become more aware all of a sudden the purpose or the mission of the entire business changes 100%. or the impact changes or how we go to market changes, which a lot of times also impact buyers. So it's a ripple effect that really goes from the inside all the way out yes. and truly makes that big change. If you were to leave our listeners with one piece of advice and you know, something that really you feel will change them or even give them something meaningful after this conversation, what would you give them as an advice from you, Neda? There's a couple of things I would say. The first thing I would say is that behaviors are driven by beliefs. And that's why it's so important to really have this soft skills and emotional intelligence training, because most of the behaviors that we have as individuals, as leaders, as employees, when we're dealing with our customers, most of the time when we behave, it's tied to a belief. So for example, if you have an employee that let's say procrastinates, if you have an employee that's really not pushing their potential, even though they have everything they need to show that, if you have a leader that's struggling with managing or struggling with showing empathy, it's because it's tied to a belief system that they've built along the years that's either serving them or sabotaging them. Now, unfortunately, most people are sabotaging themselves subconsciously through their behaviors without realizing it because they don't understand the belief patterns that they have. And then the second thing I would say is, are you interested or are you committed to your growth? There's a difference. So we get a lot of organizations that say, we really want to do this. And then at the end of the day, it's like, well, we don't know if we want our team to be gone for an hour a month. They need to work. I'm like, really? One hour a month, two hours a month, right? So they're not really committed to creating the transformation. And this is the same for individuals as well, right? Well, we see this sometimes where Individuals say, I really want to push my potential, but then they won't carve out an hour a week so that they can grow themselves, right? And this is our job to help them understand, like, if you want to create the transformation, you have to be committed, not interested, because there's a big difference. Interested is like, I think I want to do this, 
but then in two years, you're in the exact same place you were committed is no, I want to see transformation. I want to push my potential. I want my organization and my team to grow. I want my business to grow. We're committed to make this happen. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a system and a strategy to ensure it does. Yeah. Wow. That's so powerful. I mean, commitment, I feel it's like a mantra <laughs> that we should put I out know. there. To yes. make change. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, Netta, what in your shoes? I mean, you talk to a lot of executives and companies and you really speak on a lot of stages. What does the future hold for HR and companies and the world of work and how should listeners be best to prepare for it? I know it's a reoccurring conversation that you and I've been having, but I think the future of work is soft skills because when you think about it, Look at artificial intelligence. Look at all the changes that are happening technically in the world. The reality is, is that in five years from now, 10 years from now, there's going to be a whole new set of technical skills that we need. And so my point in saying that is, is that if we really want to be competitive within our organization, and we really want to be competitive as an individual and function and reach our potential, we need to really focus on our soft skills because our soft skills help us build more hard skills and hard skills are always changing. So in five years from now, your degree, right? Or what we're teaching our team to do technically in five years from now, we might have to scratch that entire system and say, now we have a new program we have to learn. We have a new technical skill that we need to bring in. And if your team is not agile and they're not emotionally intelligent and they don't have soft skills, they're not going to be able to make that shift. So the future of HR is people skills so that they can continue to grow and build technical skills. And right now we have it the opposite way around. That is true. That's really powerful. And the other thing I wanted to mention is I read a research that it said like emotional intelligence, creativity, those are going to be the hardest to find skills and number one 100%. skills that the people have to focus on. And it will be what eventually leaders will have, or most leaders will need to have to be successful yes. because the technical skills are changing. Technology is changing them. Even technology is doing some of the technical skills. So yes. people have to pivot, but those are the skills that make us human, that make us different, and that will differentiate Correct. us from AI, robots, and all of the other things that are 100%. happening, you know, in the market. So I definitely love that. And I do want to make sure that, you know, we stress that because it's definitely where the future is going. Yes. Well, Netta, it was such a pleasure. Thank if somebody you. wants to get a hold of your organization or hold of you and really, you know, pick your brain on other topics or also double down on what we talked about. What should they do next? That's great. Thank you for asking. You can definitely go to riseup4u.com, completely spelled out. There's everything you need there. And then if you want to connect with me personally, you can just find me on LinkedIn, Netta Nasserdeen, Netalina Nasserdeen. Send me a message. I would love to hop on a call with you, share more. And everything on social media, YouTube, podcasts, it's all Rise Up For You. We kept it super simple for the listener. So just type it into Google. We'll pop up and we're happy to help you in any way we can. Awesome. Well, thank you, listeners. Thank you, Netta, for joining us. Thank you for sharing knowledge and advice. And we'll see you guys on the next episode. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.